Those have it. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 27th of September of the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan AO, a Senator for the Australian Capital Territory from 1975 to 1988 and a Minister. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Senator the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan I.O. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. Um, I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 27 September 2020 of the Honourable Susan Marie Ryan I.O., former Senator for the Australian Capital Territory and Minister for Education, Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, and Special Minister of State in the Hawke Government, places on record its appreciation for her service to the Parliament and the nation, and tenders its profound sympathy to the family in their bereavement. Uh, Mr President, um, Susan Ryan uh, was a passionate advocate for gender equality and a pioneer in the fight for the interests of Australian women. She leaves behind an extensive legacy uh, full of firsts, one of the Australian Capital Territory's first senators and the first senator to represent uh, the ILP. Labor's first female cabinet minister, the first woman to hold the Women's Affairs portfolio and Australia's first age discrimination commissioner. But a sig signature achievement was the um, passage of the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, legislation that made sexual harassment unlawful and was a largely successful attempt to ensure that women had the same access to jobs, services and accommodation as men. The Act has had a lasting impact on Australian women. It encouraged more women to seek an education and employment, making it possible for women to hold employment and have a family life. These important social changes raised Australian family incomes and gave women more opportunities and economic independence. Born on 10 October 1942 in Sydney, Susan was one of four children to Arthur and Florence Ryan. Uh, growing up in Maroubra, Susan was educated at the Brigadine School and was the first in her family and school to receive a scholarship to the University of Sydney where she studied teaching. Upon graduating in 1963, Susan married Richard Butler with whom she had two children. She worked briefly as a school teacher, and then after the arrival of their first child, Justine, she switched careers, running a small business from her home in uh, Cremorne, the Living Parish Hymn Book Publishing Company. In 1965, uh, the family moved to Canberra, and Susan embarked on a Master of Arts degree in English Literature at the Australian National University. Her studies were interrupted when Richard was posted to the Australian Embassy in Vienna, and shortly after arriving, Susan and Richard welcomed the birth of their second child, Benedict. In 1970, the family moved again, this time a posting to New York. But less than a year later, Susan returned to Australia with her two children and resume her uh, uh, master's degree. She joined the Women's Electoral Lobby in 1972 and the Belconnen branch of the Australian Labour Party shortly thereafter. The women's electoral lobby began to push for direct political representation. In 1974, Susan agreed to stand for pre-selection in the new ICT seat of Fraser. While she was unsuccessful at that election, coming third in the ballot, Susan would get her chance again in 1975 when legislation to provide the ICT with two Senate positions was enacted. Running on the slogan, a woman's place is in the Senate, Susan was elected as one of the first two senators to represent the ICT and the first woman and ILP senator to represent the Territory. Susan entered Parliament during a dramatic and challenging time for the ILP. The party had just suffered a landslide election defeat after the dismissal of uh, Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister by then-Governor-General John Kerr. But Susan was not deterred. She came to this place to work hard and make a difference. She had ideas and ambitions, and two years later, when Bill Hayden became opposition leader, he gave her the shadow portfolio responsibilities for communications, arts, and the media, as well as for women's affairs, a portfolio she would hold until her resignation in 1988. Susan was, forced on the, was focused on developing social policy 
And when Bob Hawke led Labor back into government in 1983, she was appointed as Minister for Education and as the Minister for Women's Affairs. She was the first woman in the Labor Party to hold a cabinet position. During her time on the front bench, she would deliver important reforms, as I've previously mentioned, including the Sex Discrimination Act, the Affirmative Action, Equal Opportunities and Employment Act, the Public Service Reform Act, and the Equal Opportunity Commonwealth Authorities Act. But after five years in cabinet, Susan decided it was the right time to retire from her parliamentary career and she took up a role as the managing editor of Penguin Books. Susan felt she had given the best she could to politics and in 1990 she was awarded an Officer of the Order of Australia for service to the Australian Parliament. In her 1999 memoir, Catching the Wives, Susan reflected on her achievements, saying she was driven by the view that women should be able to pursue opportunities unencumbered by stifling stereotypes and that women and men should be judged on their merits. Concepts that uh, thankfully um, are entirely straightforward and universally accepted today. Uh, Susan served in many roles in her post-political career, including executive, uh, executive director for the Plastics Industry Association, executive director of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and pro-chancellor of the University of New South Wales. She also continued to fight to end discrimination and better rights for all Australians, serving as Australia's first IH Discrimination Commissioner and later the Disability Discrimination Commissioner. During her time as the IH Discrimination Commissioner, she worked tirelessly to advance the rights of older Australians. After the release of the 2015 Intergenerational Report, she argued that Australia should move to a retirement age of 70, given we are living longer than ever before. In 2015, Susan wrote, in fact, and I'm quoting her now, why are individuals leaving paid work at 60 or often earlier rather than 70 if they are more likely to live to 100 instead of 150? Age discrimination in employment is a huge barrier to preventing older Australians from continuing in the workforce. She said the report also implied that all of those older than 65 are in need of substantial and growing public support and ignored the economic potential of older people. She argued that it was time to have a conversation about how to realise the economic and social potential of an ageing population. In her first speech to the Senate in 1976, Susan noted that there were only six women in the Senate. In 2019, the Senate reached gender equality in terms of representation. In part, this was achieved because of groundbreakers like former Senator, the Honourable Susan Ryan. Susan Ryan will be remembered as someone who dedicated her life to social justice and to making this nation a better and more equal place for all Australians. To Susan's partner, Rory, and her surviving children, Justine and Ben, on behalf of the Australian Government and the Senate, I offer our deepest condolences. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. We honour today the life and contribution of former Senator and Minister, the Honourable Susan Ryan. And I speak on behalf of all Labor senators in offering our sympathy and solidarity to her family, especially her partner, Rory, and her two children, Justine and Benedict, her and her grandson, Amir, and to her many friends. It is often said you cannot be what you cannot see and yet someone has to go first. Those are the truest of leaders who have the vision of what is possible, the courage to take on the fight against those vested in the status quo, the intellectual power to craft the strategy, the charisma and humanity to bring people with them. For us, for Labor women, that was Susan Ryan. She could see it. She could see a woman at the cabinet table and she could see what Australia needed. What Australia needed that woman to achieve, and she made it happen. She wasn't a time server, she was a reformer. She came through first, but she brought others with her. She showed us the way. My generation of Labor women looked up to Susan. She inspired us in word and deed. She took a personal interest in all of us. When I saw her here, she would greet me with an enthusiastic hug. 
and she'd always offer me encouragement and assure me I was doing well, that she was proud of me and of so many others who had followed her. That pride was mutual. Labor women have lost our sister, and we will miss her. Susan was born in Sydney, and her early life had education at its centre. After convent schooling, she completed a Bachelor of Arts at Sydney Teachers College before relocating with her family to Canberra, where she embarked on a postgraduate degree in English literature. And this was interrupted when she accompanied her then husband, Richard Butler, on two overseas postings. As she described it, marriage at that time meant going wherever your husband went. She made the most of these experiences to gain knowledge and exposure to new and different thinking. She reflected that on her return to Australia from their first posting in Vienna in 1969, the preoccupations of Labor at that time were vastly different to that of comparable parties in Western Europe. Opposition to the war in Vietnam was a touchstone for those in her generation who were politically active and with whom she would later serve. On their second posting in New York, Susan was sparked in different ways by the ideas of Germaine Greer, Betty Friedan, Kate Millett, Gloria Steinem. And she found herself questioning the place of women in society relative to the place of men. She questioned why everything in personal and public life was arranged for the convenience of men and why people pretended even dull men were clever. At the same time, gifted, passionate women were passed over, neglected and restricted. She said, those of us caught in this whirlwind saw that society was structured, manufactured by its rulers to achieve these endless disparities between the sexes. Our subordination was not destiny. It was a construct of men in which we had acquiesced for far too long. Well, Susan Ryan would acquiesce no more. And the, her arrival back in Canberra led to deep engagement in both labour and feminist politics. At the same time as becoming active in her local labour branch, Susan Ryan joined the women's electoral lobby as a foundation member. Across the country, like-minded women came together and began to organise politically women like Wendy McCarthy and Eva Cox. Their objectives are familiar, perhaps depressingly so. Confronting sexism, ending discrimination in education and employment, taking control of reproductive health, improving access to childcare and achieving equal pay for equal work. In the Australian Labor Party, Susan Ryan hoped for a practical pathway to redress the wrongs done to women using legislative power to effect change. She rejoiced in the victory of the Whitlam government, although she missed out on an appointment to the groundbreaking new role of women's advisor. Her political activism led to a role running the National Secretariat for the Australian, Australian Council of State School Organisations, a role who would connect her with another early leader of our movement, Joan Kerner, for the first time. And they would go on to have an effective partnership and lasting friendship. The Whitlam government lasted only three years, but it changed our nation forever. Susan saw Labor as the key to a more humane, vibrant and equal society, believing that a feminist lobby was necessary but not sufficient. Instead of being on the outside lobbying, she wanted to be inside making the laws, and before long she was encouraged to run for pre-selection. Susan Ryan was elected to the ACT Legislative Assembly, and after a false start seeking pre-selection for the House of Representatives, she ultimately prevailed in pre-selection to the Senate. In her characteristically tongue-in-cheek telling of it, she said she overcame several reasonably glamorous male candidates. She was elected by the ACT as its first senator in 1975, one of just six women in the federal parliament, all senators. And in the wake of the Whitlam government's defeat, she had made most of the opportunity to help rebuild Labor. She cut her teeth in the Senate in her first couple of years by taking every speaking opportunity, a whip's delight. This saw her contribute on debates ranging from, ranging from Aboriginal affairs, social welfare, health and education to broadcasting, employment, defence and national security. When Bill Hayden became opposition, opposition leader after the 1977 election loss, she became the first woman to serve in Labor's shadow ministry. And her portfolios over the next six years included communications, the arts and media, and later Aboriginal affairs. Perhaps most significantly, though, in 1979, she also gained responsibility for women's affairs. Her predecessor in the role had been a man, 
Imagine a man serving in the women's affairs portfolio in any modern political party. When do you, would you have to go back to? Anyway, she would hold this portfolio in opposition and in government for nearly a decade until her resignation in 1988. Labor entered the 1980 campaign with a program for women called Towards Equality. And we made gains at this election, not enough to take government, but gains that delivered new female parliamentarians to the rank. However, to the ranks. However, these were offset by the defeat of others, mostly as a result of internal pre-selections that saw men take the place of women. This became one of the many impetuses for the introduction of affirmative action provisions within Labor, first for internal positions and eventually for Parliament. Affirmative action is part of why I am in this place today, and I was proud to take Susan's legacy on affirmative action forward with my dear friend Sharon Jackson, the then member for Hasluck, at the 2002 Special Rules Conference, we changed the rules to ensure more talented women got into the parliament. And Labor now has more women than men in the Senate, and that is the reason why the, reason why the majority of senators in this place are women for the first time in Australian history. There are many opposite who argue that affirmative action is unnecessary and undermines the principle of merit-based selections. I recall that catch cry from some of the Liberal Party, quote a girl. I'll leave it to others to judge the extent to which merit is the key metric for the selection of all of those opposite. Affirmative action recognises that structural change is required to achieve equality. It recognises that power doesn't just fall into the hands of those who haven't had it for much of the course of human history. After the 1980 election, the Fraser government no longer had control of the Senate, and Susan Ryan used this opportunity to pursue two significant private senators' bills. The first of these was legislation that sought to implement anti-discrimination and affirmative action measures for women. This approach garnered support, fanned substantial media debate and committed Labor to action. And whilst that bill did not progress into law, Susan had started the fire, and she would not stop until all of us were guided by its light. The second bill related to her portfolio of Aboriginal affairs and, sought to, affairs and sought to provide land tenure to First Nations people living on reserves in Queensland. At the time, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander citizens in Queensland were more thoroughly dispossessed than in any other part of Australia. With the backing of the Labor caucus and cross-party support, Susan Ryan confronted the blatant racism of the Bielke-Peterson regime head on. This time, the bill passed the Senate. Only the 30th private senator's bill to do so since Federation, but did not get a vote in the House of Representatives. And whilst progress on land rights was not as quick as Susan Ryan had hoped, there is no doubt she helped to spur momentum. <clears throat> when the Hawke government took office in 1983, Susan Ryan became the first female cabinet minister in Labor history. She was appointed Minister for Education and Youth Affairs and minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women. She set about implementing the feminist agenda she had envisioned. At the top of this was to bring her private senator's bill on sex discrimination into law. That the Sex Discrimination Act passed the parliament in the first year of the Hawke government speaks volumes about Susan Ryan's advocacy and the impact of capacity to transform ideas into action. It has become common in some quarters to dismiss many of the policy achievements of the Hawke government as some kind of bipartisan project that was shared across the parliament. That is plainly inaccurate. The Sex Discrimination Act accounted significant opposition, both inside and outside the parliament, because of the magnitude of its reform. It's hard to remember that at this time it was not unlawful to discriminate in this country on the basis of sex and employment, education, accommodation and the provision of goods and services. A woman's credit rating and earning capacity weren't enough to get a loan from a bank. She could only secure credit if a husband or a father took responsibility. Landlords refused to rent homes to single mothers. Community clubs throughout the country were able to bar women. Women were sacked because of their age, marital status or pregnancy. All of these injustices and inequalities were in the sights of Susan Ryan. She called the Sex Discrimination Act, and I quote, probably the most useful thing I've done in my life. I think that was a serious understatement. 
It is hard to imagine life in this country without it, or indeed an argument against it. Every woman and every girl has benefited from Susan Ryan's leadership. Nevertheless, the opposition was fierce. <coughs> indeed, 38 Conservative members and senators voted against it, including the then leader of the National Party and one Liberal MP who went on to be a Howard government minister. The Sex Discrimination Act was followed by the Affirmative Action Act, which became law in 1986. At, the, at that time, the Australian labour market was the most sex segregated in the OECD. The Act ensured women in the workforce had the opportunity to be recruited, trained and promoted on an equal basis with men. Susan Ryan heralded it not, not just as one of the biggest single steps forward in Australia's history for equality of opportunity for women in the workplace, but as a model of consensus decision-making consistent with the Hawke government's overall approach. In parallel to these, and other achievements for Australian women. Susan Ryan was also making significant inroads in education policy. When she started as a minister, just three in 10 Australians completed high school. By the time Labor left office, eight in 10 students finished school. Because of the change she and the Labor government of which she was a part started. In her four years as minister, Susan created over 36,000 places in higher education, four and a half times the number created in the last four years of the Fraser government. She also strongly argued against the reintroduction of tertiary fees at significant personal political cost. Susan believed in education as a tool for social justice. She recognised its importance in lifting people out of poverty. On her retirement, Bob Hawke reflected that she had been a minister who drove rapid change and fundamental reform, and she remains Australia's second longest serving minister for education. In a final year, she also served as special minister of state and in other roles whilst retaining her position in relation to as minister assisting the PM on the status of women until her departure in 1988. In the 30 years after she left parliament, Susan Ryan will continue to make a substantial public contribution and held various roles in the private sector. She was recognised in 1990 with the award of Officer in the Order of Australia for her contribution to this parliament. She held various roles in the superannuation sector. She continued to work for human rights and in July 2011 was appointed our first age discrimination commissioner and in 2014 disability discrimination commissioner. She brought a particular, fo particular focus to the economic security of women. She also served as pro-chancellor of the UNSW and her interest in seeing Australia becoming a republic led to her taking on the role of deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement from 2000 to 2003. Mr. President, Senators, Susan Ryan broke new ground in Australian politics. And unsurprisingly, she endured misrepresentation and abuse. She had to cut through the predictable and tiresome preoccupation of public commentators, even her colleagues, with how she looked and her marital status. We need only to reflect on how other female political leaders have been treated, and I think especially of Prime Minister Gillard, to recognise that Australian politics and public discourse still has much further to travel. 36 years after the passage of the groundbreaking Sex Discrimination Act, we continue to see gross underrepresentation of women across our society. And I have returned to the structural nature of inequality and discrimination. Many who have power in society like to believe it is because they earned it. It's because they are the most talented and the most worthy. But you know what? More often than not, they started out with power. And that means others started without it. And unless we take action, unless we make deliberate policy decisions, those structures will stay in place, recreating themselves generation after generation. And not only is that unjust to those who started without power and remain disadvantaged from birth to death, it is a great loss to us all. It is a great loss to society because people have talents and abilities that never see the light of day. In acknowledging all of Susan's many achievements, she would also expect me to point out some of what remains to be done. Because across this country, we find more women in lower paying jobs and more in precarious employment 
resulting in women finding it harder to be economically independent. Susan Ryan's wisdom help us give us the, some of the tools to see how much more there is still to be done. The organisation we now know as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency tells us that the full-time remuneration gender pay gap is at 20.8 per cent, meaning men, men working full-time earn $25,600 plus on average a year more than women working full-time. The full-time base salary gender pay gap is 15.5 per cent. You see, as Susan observed, society was built by men for men, and that is why Labor women understand there is a limit to leaning in. We need to break down the structural barriers that block women's full participation and equality in Australia. We already have women retiring with 47 per cent less superannuation than men. Around three quarters of the Australians who have been forced to withdraw from their super this year are women. That is not empowerment, that is impoverishment. Women over 55 are the fastest growing group of people at risk of homelessness in Australia. Women over 60 represent the largest cohort on JobSeeker. And without access to affordable childcare, many parents will be forced to give up or turn down work. And we know that it is a sacrifice most often taken by women. Study after study has shown that affordable childcare would increase women's workforce participation. This budget, which should have been a blueprint for our economic future beyond the pandemic, does nothing to increase women's participation, nothing to, in to tackle insecure work or improve access to childcare, nothing to redress the gender pay gap or shrinking super balances and no plan to help women and their children escaping family violence and a cabinet with Susan Ryan at the table would never have made those decisions. She would never have acquiesced. And she taught those Labor women who have followed her not to acquiesce either. She was the first but her legacy in this nation will last, not just in the law she wrote, but among the Labor women who follow her. Because we will continue the project of building a truly equal Australia. Our entire movement mourns the loss of one of our greatest. And as we mourn her passing and in closing, I once again extend my personal sympathies and the sympathies of all my colleagues to Susan Ryan's family, to Rory, Justine and Benedict and Amir and her many friends. I spoke with Justine earlier today. She spoke of how completely her mother dedicated her life's work to the Labor movement. Susan Ryan was more than an effective legislator, although she was certainly that. She really wanted to make Australia better. Justine told me how she recently found her mother's first campaign T-shirt, which declared a woman's place is in the House and in the Senate. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this chamber today, and looking at those behind me, it is clear that is yet another campaign that Susan Watt Ryan won. Yeah. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I rise today to express condolences on behalf of the Australian Greens to the family, friends and colleagues of the Honourable Susan Ryan AO. And I'd like to associate uh, our party with the remarks that have been made already about this remarkable woman. Um, as has been said, former Senator Susan Ryan was a trailblazer for women's representation in parliament and gender equality in all workplaces. I imagine she would have been pleased to see that just this week the Senate has finally reached the point of being majority women, with the arrival of our Green Senator Lydia Thorpe, uh, a proud First Nations woman, on Tuesday to this place. Um, Susan Ryan once said of her motivation for entering politics, I felt from the youngest possible age that it was unfair, intolerable really, that females were regarded as second-class citizens. That was going to be the big thing that I wanted to change. And so she did. She helped establish the women's electoral lobby. She was elected to parliament as a single mother and became the first woman in the ALP cabinet. She was the first minister for the status of women and she set her sights on dismantling gender equality, uh, inequality. I should say. She introduced the first women's budget impact statement in 1984, which persisted until 2014, when former Prime Minister and one-time Minister for Women, Tony Abbott, axed it. Her work to introduce the Sex Discrimination Act was a crucial reform that has continued to shape Australian society. In abuse that will be familiar to many of the women in this place, conservative sectors called Susan Ryan radical and targeted her as Australia's feminist dictator. And yet these are the things she was trying to change. 
making it unlawful to sack a woman because she got married or pregnant, making it unlawful to sack someone just because they were a woman, making it unlawful to sexually harass your staff, providing paid parental leave, allowing women to get home loans and increasing women's participation in university. Today it would be completely unacceptable for those basic inequalities to persist. And the change in that attitude is a testament to the work that Susan did. Anne Summers' tribute to Susan noted the brutal reality of politics, noting that Susan's remarkable policy wins were often more hard won than, it is, than is appreciated today and seldom achieved without what were often excruciating compromises. Again, this is something with which many in this place are familiar. Too often, women are expected to compromise. While much remains to be done to achieve gender equality, Susan's pioneering efforts built the platform to, for progress to continue to be made. Um, I and the Australian Greens pay tribute to her fortitude, resilience and determination and thank her for opening the door for a better Australia for women and girls. A woman's place is in the House and the Senate and the Cabinet. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, I too rise um, today, but particularly I rise representing the Minister for Women, uh, the Honourable Maurice Payne, um, who is unable to be here today. But uh, I would also like to have the remarks, my remarks, associated with others in this place, and also the remarks that were made by the Prime Minister um, in his condolence motion for the Honourable Susan Ryan AO. Um, in the past 45 years since Susan Ryan was elected, much has changed for the representation of women in this place. When Susan Ryan entered this House in 1975, she became just one of six women in the upper house. And uh, as has been said by those before me, her election slogan at that time was a woman's place is in the Senate. And uh, today that is absolutely true. Um, and she also, um, you know, it was a very much a year, an early pronouncement of the passionate advocate for women that Susan Ryan was to become. Whilst I, I didn't know Susan Ryan, I have no doubt that she would be very pleased with the representation uh, that we see in this place today, with more women than men now representing the Australian people in the Senate. Over in the House of Representatives, at the time Susan was elected, that there was no women. Uh, and not only that, there were no women leaders or ministers in any state parliament in Australia. Uh, and from what I hear, there was constant confusion about who Susan was. Um, most young women in Parliament House were secretaries and assistants, and people would often ask uh, Susan which senator that she worked for. I can't imagine the kind of response that they might have got to asking that question. But Susan focused on the job at hand, uh, ignoring the commentary and learning the ropes and has become now known as one of the great trailblazers for this Senate for women. Um, she was also clearly one, someone who was determined never to become a single-issue po politician. Um, during those early years, she spoke on an incredible range of topics during her speeches, the questions in you know, Senate committee work, talked about the environment, she talked about Indigenous issues, telecommunications, tax reform, urban planning, amongst many other things. And with an extraordinary broad range of interests um, and clearly a focus on the community, she was rightfully proud and excited when she was sworn as a minister in 1983, the first woman in a federal Labor cabinet. Many of us have seen um, the group photos of Susan with, uh, with all her male colleagues at the time, and I think it is absolutely a true reflection of what this place was like back in those days. But she combined her 12 years um, here uh, as a role of senator, um, also um, and, uh, as a senator for the ACT, but also as a mother. Um, and she managed to balance these two roles, as many people now do these days, without even a thought. So um, her trailblazing um, as a mother and a senator and delivering on behalf of the Australian people is certainly a great accomplishment that she should always be rec uh, recognised for. But also, as the Minister for Education and Youth Affairs, um, she achieved many, many significant achievements, uh, not the least of which was the significant increase in the Year uh, 12 retention rates. She was also uh, the minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women for almost half a decade, a position proudly held today by the Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Women, the Honourable Maurice Payne, whose uh, remarks today 
um, are being delivered uh, by me as well. Um, Susan was the architect of the Sex Discrimination Act, uh, which made sexual harassment illegal for the first time and outlawed discrimination on the basis of sex, marital status and pregnancy. Um, characteristically, after leaving this parliament, uh, Susan kept on looking for ways that she could make Australia better, a better place for everyone. She became our first ever age discrimination commissioner, and she also served as the disability uh, discrimination commissioner too. From 2000 to 2007, she was the president of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and the chancellor of the University of New South Wales for over a decade. These roles in post-politics -polit life allowed Susan to follow her passion of helping people, transcending limitations and overcoming constraints, and a focus on all people equally. Susan was a powerhouse, a lively and energetic part of Australia's national story and absolutely a true groundbreaker. Susan's sudden death was a shock to many. While I did not know Susan personally, I know that as a parliament the memory of Susan as a woman leader uh, will be honoured right from well into the future. I know uh, the Minister for Women would have been, liked to have been here today to make remarks and associate herself with the condolence motions being given today, because I know that Susan played a very, very important role uh, in Minister Payne's life, and she, as she did for so many other women in this parliament. Without a doubt, every one of us here today is a beneficiary of the legacy that she leaves us. So to her partner, to her children uh, and to her friends and her close ones, we offer our heartfelt condolences. To Susan, we give you our thanks. I'll go to Senator McKenzie and then I'll come to you, Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Mr President. As Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I rise today to acknowledge the passing of former Senator and Minister, the Honourable Susan Ryan, and associate the National Party, obviously, uh, with the comments of um, senators and, and leaders here today. Whilst uh, we can argue the toss on structural change or cultural change when it comes to women's changing and involving role in society and in parliament as one of the key institutions of our liberal democracy, um, I think all of us in this chamber uh, can be very proud of, uh, albeit our different approaches, uh, to increasing the number of women's involvement in parliamentary life and in public debate and, and how that will actually have flow-on benefits into the broader community. Uh, but for Senator Susan Ryan to be the first uh, means that uh, the burden is heavier and you need to get it just right so that there will be successive uh, women after you. And uh, I just I think it's amazing um, what she was able to achieve. Um, the slogan I think that Senator Wong mentioned, a woman's places in the uh, the Senate, at the House, and the Senate, was um, a T-shirt I was given also on getting pre-selected. So I think it resonates um, with a lot of us that that get here um, that slogan. And I, you know. I think her, that being the first woman to hold a ministerial office uh, is something to note. Also that she championed education uh, to the point it is the National Party constituency that really benefited from uh, that increase in higher education places uh, and that increase in year 12 attainment. Um, previously, previous to uh, the Hawke government's reforms, really um, the percentage of Australian uh, young people that headed off to university was quite um, it was incredibly small and predominantly came from uh, elite families in capital cities uh, and so really opening that up uh, increased the enfranchisement and the inclusion of uh, people that don't go to grammar schools uh, which is also a good thing um, and I say that as a proud grammarian but uh, you know that that's, uh, that was a great reform um, her lasting legacy, though, is the landmark Sex Discrimination Act and the Affirmative Action Act. And I think uh, you know, Senator Waters has, has stood up and proudly proclaimed uh, how many uh, female senators uh, the Greens have, and, and I know uh, the Labor Party has some structural mechanisms to ensure that uh, they, they get um, a certain number of, of female senators and, and House representatives in this place. But for a party like the National Party uh, to actually proudly stand here and have 80 per cent of our senators to be female 
uh, without a structural readjustment, but with actually a grassroots uh, full enfranchisement of our membership, voting for every single one of the strong, articulate, intelligent women that our divisions have sent here, I think speaks more broadly um, to what we can all do on both sides of the chamber to increase the diversity of our parliament and that we come here with different value systems, obviously, and therefore represent the broader Australian public. Um, but we can, all do, we can all do better in our own uh, ways. So when she came to the Senate in 1975, there were just six women. And I think, Senator Rustin, you made great commentary about how um, this chamber really reflects uh, the work of Susan Ryan and all who've gone after her uh, on both sides of the ministry uh, to increase the inclusion of women. Um, also, being a single mum and a minister is pretty tough. And uh, to be the first person that did that way before uh, you know, partners might have chosen to look after kids or that there was even childcare available, I think is quite an incredible um, feat and speaks to her determination and strength to represent her community and her government. Sympathies uh, to her uh, family and friends uh, and valet Susan Ryan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Zazelja. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I, as a senator for the ACT, uh, want to pay a special tribute to uh, the Honourable Susan Ryan uh, and send condolences to her family and to her loved ones. Um, it is interesting, as has been pointed out, uh, Susan Ryan, uh, like a couple of us in this chamber, uh, had a background first uh, in what was the precursor to the ACT Legislative Assembly, as, as Senator Gallagher and myself uh, did, uh, before going on to represent the ACT uh, and having the great honour to represent the ACT as a senator uh, from 1975 as the first of one of the, as one of the two uh, first two uh, senators representing the Australian Capital Territory, and it's great to follow in the footsteps of others. Um, and and we talk about the legacy uh, of Susan Ryan in terms of being a trailblazer for women, and we've seen that obviously uh, in the ACT Legislative Assembly. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, female chief ministers. We've seen them on both sides with Rosemary Follett. Uh, we saw it, of course, with Kate Carnell uh, on the Liberal side, with Senator, uh, now Senator Katie Gallagher, as, of course, as well, uh, and a number in senior positions. And I make the point, a similar point to what was made in terms of uh, female representation, as we celebrate the fact that there are a majority in the Senate. In the ACT Legislative Assembly, we see the same, uh, and in fact, uh, we see it on both sides. We see both uh, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party uh, having a, a majority of women in the ACT Legislative Assembly uh, as we as we speak. Uh, we've gotten there through different parts. Uh, the ACT Liberals have chosen not to get there uh, through the use of quotas, uh, but we do believe uh, that we have outstanding representatives, uh, one way or another, and uh, and it's been a great privilege to see that uh, and see that evolution and I think in Canberra we see it uh, most particularly uh, in of course in um, her opportunities that she had to serve uh, in the Hawke ministry uh, first as the minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women uh, and then of course as the Minister for Education some of those achievements in both of those portfolios have been touched on but uh, one of the ones in education uh, which I think uh, Susan Ryan was of course most proud of was changes to the year 12 retention rate, and so I'd commend uh, that work. Uh, she later uh, had, a, had a very distinguished career, of course, um, after politics, uh, after leaving uh, this place and going on to a number of very important positions, a number of which have been mentioned, including in universities and superannuation, uh, and as it, as the Age Discrimination Commissioner, and it was in that role. Um, so Susan Ryan was uh, one of my senators when I was growing up here in Canberra, uh, uh, along with the great uh, Margaret Reid, uh, former president of the Senate. Uh, we were well represented, uh, and so I didn't know her in that role. Obviously, as a as a young uh, boy uh, growing up in the 1980s, uh, she was one of the senators representing me. But I did have the opportunity to meet her uh, in that later role as Age Discrimination Commissioner. And I did find her to be a, a thoroughly decent, a, a highly engaging, uh, highly intelligent, uh, very impressive human being. But uh, I also found that, you know, given her reputation, uh, I was 
quite struck uh, by the great humility uh, which she displayed in the way that she dealt uh, with those around her. Um, of course, a couple of those uh, great contributions that have been mentioned that are worth reiterating, uh, the Sex Discrimination Act and the sex making sexual harassment illegal uh, for the first time a great step forward, and the Affirmative Action Equal Employment Opportunity for Women Act. Uh, now, Susan Ryan once reflected that politics is like diving into the surf, and she said you don't linger at the edge, she said you jump in and fight your way through the breakers. Finally, you get to the still, deep water beyond. You see if you can catch a wave and ride it to the shore. Few things in life are as exhilarating. When the wave is finished, it's not the end of the story. Uh, can I uh, pay tribute uh, to Susan Ryan's life, uh, to her public legacy, uh, and can I send my condolences to her loved ones, to her friends and family? Uh, may she rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Zizel. Just Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Ap Acting Deputy President. And my apologies. I you were on the list before, Senator Zizelja. <laughs> An advocate for equality, feminist, trailblazer, the first. These are all attributes mentioned in association with the late Susan Ryan AO. Former Senator Ryan was elected as the first Labor senator for the ACT in 1975. Her slogan at the time was, a woman's place is in the House, in the Senate and everywhere decisions are made. Her path to the Senate is reasonably well known. Susan trained as a teacher and worked in the profession until the birth of her first child. Along with her family, Susan moved to Canberra in 1965 and enrolled as a postgraduate at ANU. Despite living overseas and studying, she never lost her passion for education and was appointed as the National Executive Officer for the Australian Council of State School Organisations in 1973. Her involvement in the women's movement, particularly the formation of the women's electoral lobby, convinced her that her fight for equality had to take on a more pointed political approach. So she joined the Australian Labor Party and became an active became active on behalf of her local community. A short stint on the non-governing ACT House of Assembly preceded her election to this chamber in 1975. Some years after her time in the Senate, she said of her election, and I quote, after being elected in 1975, I joined four women who had already been in the Senate for a short period, Liberal Senators Guilfoyle and Martin and Labor Senators Coleman and Meltzer. Senators, Senators Walters from Tasmania was also elected in 1975, so there were six. Across Kings Hall in the House of Representatives, there were no women. There were no women leaders or ministers in any state parliament. Margaret Guilfoyle became the first and sole female cabinet minister in the Fraser government. Her election was greeted with much media interest, mainly emphasising her gender, her age, her hair colour, marital status she was divorced, physical size and motherhood. There was very little, if any, commentary on her political agenda or policy interests and experience. Susan joined the Shadow Ministry not long after she joined the Parliament. She was a passionate and highly articulate debater and used her time in the Senate to great effect. Her central objective of economic independence for all guided her many achievements as Labor's first female cabinet minister in the Hawke government. Susan's view was that economic independence meant the capacity to provide your own, for your own needs and the needs for whom you are directly responsible. She began her wor work in two key areas, tackling discrimination against women and lifting the high school retention rate and increasing funding and places at universities and TAFEs. Just as we take the increased participation and leadership of women in politics and other spheres for granted now, we also assume nearly all high school students will complete Year 12. In the years leading up to Susan Ryan being sworn in as Minister for Education in 1983, the high school retention rate in my home state of Tasmania was 27 per cent. Nearly three quarters of Tasmanian's high school students in the early 1980s did not complete Year 12. Susan took a proposal to the National Economic Summit in 1983 that this, that this appalling low rate needed to be lifted to at least two-thirds by 1990. 
This was overwhelmingly achieved in most states and territories. What flowed from this was an increased demand for places in universities and tables, a cause she also advanced with passion. Of course, Susan Ryan is remembered for her pioneering sex discrimination bill and the Affirmative Action Bill. Her work highlighting the impact of government and policy decisions on women began much earlier than that. In 1981, from opposition, Susan made a detailed analysis of the effect of the budget on women and published it. From this, the women's budget statement was born. The first official publication of the statement was produced by the Office for the Status of Women in 1984. Her statement announcing this was met with uh, her statement announcing this was met with much derision from some of the then opposition. In fact, the first time the Liberal Party embarked on a similar process was when Dr John Hewson was leader of the opposition. After she left her successful political career, Susan Ryan went on to have an equally successful role in publishing, superannuation and industry. Her great friend, Wendy McCarthy, says of Susan and her work, every 10 years or so she would change careers and we would all follow her and support her. You couldn't help but get caught up with her enthusiasm for reform and change, her generosity and her great sense of fun. In addition to her paid roles, Susan Ryan threw, threw her enthusiasm and commitment into the Australian Republican movement. In more recent times, Australians got to know Susan as her, our first age discrimination commissioner. She brought all the attributes Wendy McCarthy identified and combined them with her deep knowledge and understanding of government and its processes to advocate for real change for older Australians. For a short time, she was also Disability Discrimination Commissioner. Although her role as Age Discrimination Commissioner ended in 2016, Susan's advocacy for older Australians didn't. She was a frequent panellist on television and would happily use whatever platform was offered to highlight her concerns about the treatment of older Australians. In 1990, Susan was appointed as an Officer of the Order of Australia. As with any political career, hers wasn't all smooth sailing, but it was one of incredible achievement. Her friends, colleagues and many associates remember Susan as a frightening, intelligent, politically savvy, funny, optimistic and committed. Susan Ryan really was the life of the Labor Party during her time in Parliament. Generations of Australians, particularly women, have and will follow where she led thanks to her commitment to equality and education reforms, and that is her legacy. From the, ti from the time of her community involvement until her untimely timely death, Susan was a true feminist. Some time ago, someone asked her about post-feminism. In typical Susan style, she replied, I struggle with postmodernism in architecture, literature and literary criticism, and I think that post-feminism is uncalled for. <laughs> Along with all the members of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party, I extend my condolences to Susan's partner, Rory, and her two children and her extended family and friends. Can I also place on record my thanks to them for sharing Susan with the Labor Party, the wider Labor movement and our nation. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill, did you wish to also add some comments? Yes, I do. Thank, thank you very you. much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to rise today and speak on the sudden and tragic passing of former Senator Susan Ryan AO, a former Hawke Cabinet Minister, indeed Labor's first female Cabinet Minister. She was a pioneer in every sense. She broke that glass ceiling in the territory. Uh, in this party, and in so many areas of civic life following her retirement politics. And she was a loving and proud mum and grandma as well. To her family, I want to say I'm so sorry for your great loss. And I thank you for your great generosity in sharing her with the nation, whose history she changed. I want to associate myself also with the remarks of uh, those who have contributed to this condolence motion this afternoon. And I think uh, Senator Wong's framing of the life of Susan Ryan as a critical driver of significant historical change uh, is a very accurate summary of the powerful 
powerful impact that Susan Ryan had on our nation. Born in Sydney in 1942, she grew up in the great labour suburb of Maroubra, achieving a BA at Sydney Teachers College before working as a school teacher, a small business owner and second secretary at the Australian Embassy in Vienna. After moving to Canberra, she graduated with a Master of Arts degree from ANU and became a foundational member of the Belconnen branch of the ALP and the Women's Electoral Lobby, one of countless political actions she would take for the empowerment of Australian women. She was subsequently elected to the ACT House of Assembly in 1975 and before becoming one of the first two senators for the ACT, elected on that much uh, re repeated uh, mantra that's featured in the speeches this afternoon, the unabashedly feminist, feminist statement, a woman's place is in the House and the Senate and everywhere decisions is, are made. She made history as a 33-year-old single mother and eight years later would change history as a pivotal member of the Hawke government. In her role as a cabinet minister, she was able to make those changes for women that were so desperately needed at that time. When Hawke was elected in 1983, she was made Minister for Education and Youth Affairs and the first ever Minister for the Status of Women. She wasted no time and soon set about tearing down the barriers that Australian women had faced for generations. Her landmark work was, of course, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, which sought to eliminate, so far as is possible, discrimination against persons on the ground of sex, marital status, pregnancy or potential pregnancy in the areas of work, accommodation, education, the provision of goods, facilities and services, the disposal of land, the activities of clubs and the administration of Commonwealth laws and programs. This wide-ranging act ensured that the rights of women were protected by legislation. It was a giant step forward for women all across the country. This act, along with the Affirmative Action Equal Employment Opportunity for Women Act, embodied the greatest beliefs of the labour movement, that through fair and equitable employment in a fair and equitable society, humanity can flourish and people can build a life worth living. Her tenure as Education Minister was no less successful, with Paul Keating remarking that her great achievement was to lift year 10 retention rates in schools, which was an abysmal three in 10 when she took office in 1983, to, the end, to end at nine in 10 in 1996. This also included the doubling of the number of female graduates from high school. This surely, surely helped pave the way for the economic successes that flowed in the decades after the Hawke and Keating era, as a whole generation of young Australian women transitioned through that schooling into the jobs of the future. She, even after she left parliament, she continued to break ground, as others have said, serving as the first age discrimination commissioner, as Dis disability discrimination commissioner, and as president of the Australian Institute of the Superannuation Trustees, while continuing to campaign for an Australian Republic and an Australian Bill of Rights. Her life was also marked by a long affiliation with her Irish heritage and its wonderful culture. Like myself, she was an Australian of Irish flavour, Catholic and Labor. She remarked that her lifelong desire for social justice was kindled due to the strong values-based teaching she received at a Brigidine school in Sydney. The Brigidines are a teaching order of nuns founded in Ireland in the 19th century who contributed significantly to Catholic education in Australia. Several decades later, uh, Susan was awarded the Lifetime Achievement of the Bridget Award by an, uh, the Irish Labor Friendship Women's Group uh, in 2016. Indeed, she was its inaugural awardee uh, of that award named after the very St Bridget, uh, whose values and philosophy inspired uh, the Bridgetine nuns who taught Susan. Susan's love of Ireland and the Irish people was profound and a hallmark of her entire life. I'm advised by my good friend uh, Dermot Ryan, who I know is a good friend also of Senator uh, Tony Sheldon, uh, is preparing an obituary for the Irish Times um, and Susan's family uh, tree connects her back to County Wexford, 
Now, this is an important thing to Irish people. It's not just enough to be from Ireland. You have to be from a particular county. Even in later life, Susan joined the, the annual Irish winter school in Sydney to learn the Irish language in order, she said, to be able to fit in when she visited the country. She championed the project to erect a monument to the Great Irish Famine in Sydney, which commemorated the thousand of Irish women who escaped the famine by emigrating to Australia, and, and she spoke at the fifth annual comm commemoration ceremony in 2004. Susan was also a member and a speaker at the Ashling Society, an Irish-Australian cultural group. She was a frequent supporter and patron of Apunsky's Theatre in Sydney, and in 2019, was named one of the top 100 Irish Australians of all time by the Irish Echo, up there with Paul Keating, Ben Chifley and John Curtin. It's not surprising that the last conversation I had with Susan Ryan earlier this year was at an Irish event around St Patrick's Day. It was to mark the 20th year of the presence of the Irish Consulate in Sydney and uh, convened by the Consul General there, uh, Owen Feeney, it was to celebrate 20 historical Australian Irish uh, figures. As she always did, Susan took the time to talk to everyone in the room. She took me aside, and as she had done on many occasions, she encouraged me, she supported me, she understood me, as only a woman in the Great Labor Party can. Susan's legacy will be felt by generations of Australians to come, and her example will shine to all Australian women. Her work will live on as the best example of Australians' belief in a fair go for all, no matter the circumstances of your birth. She was a credit to this chamber, to the great Australian Labor Party and to the nation. I echo the words of the Brigidine sisters who gave their thanks across the Brigidine uh, International Network last week for Susan's rich life, for her public service to Australia, and I, like them, offer my sincere sympathy to her family and friends Vale, Susan Ryan, you are already missed. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, today I rise, along with many others, to make some personal remarks and pay tribute to the wonderful Susan Ryan. The strength of her legacy uh, is immeasurable and it is um, indelible in my own life as I reflect on. Uh, as a young woman uh, completing her high school education in the 1980s, uh, with that lift in retention rates across the country uh, for girls and uh, indeed uh, young working class men in particular, along with that came a much greater diversity of subjects that we could study and greatly improved quality of education. Uh, that indeed has had a long-term legacy. My mother had great respect for Susan Ryan. Um, my mother, Sandra, was also an early member of the women's electoral lobby. As a woman, she struggled with being unable to get a home loan in her own name uh, and being paid less than men uh, at a lower hourly rate uh, within the same profession. So, as a woman in the Labor Party, uh, as a, someone who joined in the early 1990s, uh, at the end of Susan's parliamentary career, it was one of those. Uh, she was indeed an inspiration for me uh, to join the Great Australian Labor Party. But my own knowledge of Susan indeed comes through my work in this place, in particular with her work at the Australian Human Rights Commission as uh, the Age Discrimination Commissioner. And her enormous capacity to understand intersecting human rights debates uh, uh, has been of great benefit to the nation, uh, right from her participation in these debates in the 1960s and 70s, right through to her work as Age Discrimination Commissioner. She made some remarks while she was the uh, Age Discrimination Commissioner to an event called the Homosexual Histories Conference back in 2014. And uh, she said in good humour there, she said, um, 
I am in some, some senses an unlikely candidate as an advocate for homosexual law reform. As a young heterosexual woman coming of age in post-war Australia, educated in a strict and conservative Catholic environment, I did not really know much about homosexuality until well into adulthood. In fact, we were not taught much about sexuality in general, our own or anyone else's. In that sense, I was very much a product of my generation. Um, she went on to say, uh, talk about how she became involved in debates in gay law reform here in the ACT in very early uh, votes in the 1970s to decriminalise homosexuality uh, and indeed also in abortion uh, law reform uh, debates here. So she was indeed um, active not just in sex discrimination but in disability discrimination, in sexuality uh, and uh, gender identity discrimination throughout her career. Uh, in, as, the, as the Age Discrimination Commissioner, she was also at the Human Rights Commission at a very important point in time for the LGBTI community when this parliament under the Labor government considered the reforms to the Sex Discrimination Act to amend the Sex Discrimination Act uh, so that uh, not only did it cover sex discrimination but it also dis uh, covered sexuality, gender identity uh, and uh, being intersex. At that time, I'm very grateful that Susan was the Age Discrimination Commissioner because she was really able to help see the way through the enabling of the exemptions to that Sex Discrimination Act uh, being lifted out of aged care so that you can no longer discriminate uh, against someone because of their sexual orientation, gender identity or intersex status uh, in aged care uh, services and facilities here in Australia anymore. This is a principle that needs to extend across all Commonwealth uh, and community services so that there aren't exemptions for uh, any primary service that should be someone's right to access. So I am profoundly uh, grateful for the inspiration of Susan Ryan's life. And as I have listened to people today talk about her colour and vibrancy as a person, I'm also reminded really of how dig deep she had to dig in order to continue that work. And it's a great inspiration to me to know that in a tough week and on a tough day uh, in politics and in this chamber, you can really see what a difference uh, one person can make to our national fabric. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, if there are a uh, Senator Seward. You, um, Sorry, Acting Senator Sheldon. I shall give precedence to Senator Seward. Uh, thank you, and I, I will be brief because um, people have said so many wonderful things about Susan Ryan, and I firstly would like to offer my condolences to uh, Susan's uh, family, friends, and colleagues. I'd be so bold as to say every woman in Australia has benefited from the work that Susan Ryan did, and I. I think there's a number of young women today that don't, still don't really get or believe that women were forced to resign. Some women were forced to resign when they got married. Some women had to get their sons to go guarantors for loans. Women were just subject to, I think, nowadays, things that younger women Sort of, well, they appreciate um, the, uh, the strides that have been made. They, they don't get that people like Susan put so much effort into achieving those changes. And one of the things that I and I wanted to go to the work, which is where I um, did some work with uh, Susan Ryan, is when she was the Age Discrimination Commissioner. Um, I believe that she carried on her excellent work that she had done in this place and many other places as the Age Discrimination Commissioner. She was the inaugural uh, commissioner and really got it 
really got how um, older people are being discriminated against still in many areas, including in aged care, and I was part of that discussion, having been the aged care spokesperson on those issues and worked with um, some very close friends in Western Australia on, on that particular issue as well. Um, so I, I'd like to particularly comment on that, but also generally in employment. And this is why what the work that Susan was doing is so important right, right now, and that is the discrimination that is still going on for older workers, but also particularly older women workers. They are the fastest growing cohort of those that are unemployed. They are ageing into uh, poverty in on the, uh, as older women not being able to find work on very low income support payments. They're ageing into the um, poverty uh, as they um, wait to be able to move on to the age pension, using up all their, their savings. It's absolutely imperative that these issues are dealt with. And Susan knew that. She was working on that. She held forums and I attended some of those in terms of how do, how do we work with business and with employers to ensure that older workers are, are taken on. Um, and raising those issues and, and always, always there were the issue around older women. Um, and then, as has also been pointed out, um, she then became the um, disability um, dis, uh, discrimination commissioner as well, taking the same, and again I had that portfolio at the time, taking the same gusto into those issues, disability discrimination issues as well. Um, not only did we have a number of discussions and, and Susan uh, was very active throughout the country, but also asking questions across the estimates table um, when she was commissioner. And she was she was also always very glad and uh, in in and to talk about the issues across the estimates table. Um, she made an enormous contribution to this country, particularly to the women of this country. She'll be remembered for um, for all the work uh, that she did. And it also reminded me um, in terms of some of the things from your childhood and your young adulthood that you take with you your whole life. And the work that she did, I, I have taken with me all throughout my life. And um, it was an honour to be able to, at just in a small degree, work with her on these really important issues. So um, Vale, Susan Ryan, you won't be forgotten. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. All of us women of the Senate stand here on the shoulders of a magnificent woman, Susan Marie Ryan. When she was elected to one of the two newly created ACT Senate seats in 1975, as, as I think everyone in this place has said, she was campaigned on the slogan, a women's place is in the Senate. And it is. In fact, the only Labor senators from Tasmania are women. We're all women. How very pleased she must have been when the Senate finally achieved gender equality a little over a year ago. How much we owe her. Many adjectives have been used to describe Susan, whose Senate career from 75 to 86 was only part of a long and multifaceted working life dedicated to equality and human rights. She has been described as a luminary, a fierce champion, a trailblazer, a feminist hero and a labour giant. She was all these things and more. And she will be remembered as a fierce champion for women's rights and others discriminated, other discriminated Australians after her sudden death just 11 days ago. Those before me have outlined her groundbreaking positions and work as a minister in the Hawke government, so I won't go over that. But Labor leader Anthony Albanese has said that she changed Australia for the better, and I do agree with that. This is something that we must all aspire to. In her lifetime, she saw and influenced incredible changes. We must not forget a world where women were pillarised for seeking elected office, where women could be sacked simply for falling pregnant, where equal pay was a faraway dream where the idea of a woman taking up a blue-collar trade or becoming a CEO was unheard of, in fact shunned. 
and rights for older Australians and those living with disability were barely imaginable. Many of these things today that we take for granted were issues which were championed by Susan and she stood up to years of vilification because of this work. Paul Keating said her great achievement was to set in motion lifting year 12 retention rates from 3 in 10 in 83 to 9 in 10 by 96. This revolutionised education in Australia, most particularly for girls, he said, and he was correct. The best thing all 38 of us, all today's Sen uh, women senators, can do is to pledge that we will pursue her leg legacy. We will confront the obstacles and rise above them. We owe Susan Ryan a debt best paid by redoubling our commitment to equality for all Australians, a commitment to not seeing older workers thrown on the trash heap because of a recession, to not seeing Australians with disability ignored, denied opportunity and resources, to ensure that discrimination does not hobble the lives of Australian women and to ensure that regardless of your sexual orientation, gender, cultural background, eth ethnicity, age or ability, you get a fair go in this country we love. I want to personally thank Susan Ryan, not because I knew her well, but because without her example, her voice, her steady hand, her carefully considered and articulate arguments, I simply may not be here. And my daughter and hundreds of thousands of Tasmanian women, older Tasmanians and Tasmanians living with a disability may not have had the education and opportunities they've had today. In saying that, I note that the job is not done. With recession upon us and so many young Australians wondering where they will find a place in life, with so many older Australians worried about being left out of the workforce and others frightened that their retirement and old age may not be one where they will have the resources to allow them to live with dignity and receive the care that they need, and so many Australians living with disability still denied the opportunity to fully participate in society. And Austra uh, Indigenous Australians still denied the voice and opportunity that is rightfully theirs. With the cost of obtaining an education moving out of reach for many and the cost of childcaring leaving many women unable to carve out a career of their dreams, and is, there is still much, so much more to struggle for and to win. And we will do that with our path illuminated by the bright light held in Susan Ryan's steady, intelligent, guiding hands. My sincere condolences to her partner, Rory Sutton, her children and all who loved her. Thank you, Senator Burke. It's Senator Sheldon, who's been patiently waiting. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to honour the life of Susan Ryan, architect of the World Leading Discrimination Act, first female Labor cabinet minister and icon for social justice in Australia. The woman who, as Education Minister, more than doubled the high school retention rate, including for girls. One of, one of our best fighters. Talks volumes of her values and capacity when you look at the fact that she works so hard for the rights of humanity, women and men, the able and disabled, and most recently for older Australians and Australians living with disabilities as Age and Discrimination Commissioner. And disability, sorry, Age and Disability, Disability and Discrimination Commissioner, and of course a, ma a major ally to the increase in the voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and young people. And of course, how sorry we are, we can't get to hear her views this week on the coalition's federal budget, a budget which has had its two biggest failings: the ignoring of the impact of this recession on women and older workers. Susan Ryan died suddenly the last week. We should never forget that she has done for all Australians by making our society fairer, more inclusive, more willing to back in the aspirations of all women and men and their families. She's lived a life of firsts. Her Irish working class parents, Florence and Francis, worked as sales assistants and a public servant. She was the first in her family to go to university. She was the first in her school to win a scholarship to university. It is a stark reminder to all of us how unequal our society was when, at the time, she was then forced to pay back, pay back that scholarship because she got married. 
We should all remember that it was not long ago that all women had to resign from the public service when they got married and that they could be fired from any job when they became pregnant. She was also, of course, the first female member of the Labor cabinet when she joined the Hawke cabinet in 1983 as Education and Youth Affairs Minister. Even when she left the parliament, she kept fighting for the rights and power of working people. She was deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement from 2000 to 2003. And of course, there was her important work on strengthening superannuation. In her seven years as the president of the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees until 2007, she fought for the right for all Australians to have access to a dignified retirement and for super funds to continue to play a role in democratising financial systems in Australia. Acting Deputy President, we have come a long way since the 1950s and 60s where Susan Ryan was educated as a Bridgetine Catholic in the Bridgetine Catholic College in Sydney's eastern suburbs, where a passion for social justice was encouraged and where she was a brilliant debater and a fearless advocate for her schoolmates. But we must never forget how hard it was to get even basic employment protections for women and how stubborn inequalities persist in Australia still, like the gender pay gap and the harassment and discrimination experienced by women every day in our workplaces and institutions. I want to say something about dogged activism of Susan Ryan as well. She was a respected legislator and a pragmatic political operator. But her pragmatism and wily role in Cabinet was first and foremost in the service of her ideals. She did not court power for its own sake. She focused on outcomes and she often clashed with her Cabinet colleagues on points of principle. She worked hard across the factions and across the aisle to give all working people real power to shape their own destinies. She was also loved for a sense of humour. In Susan's memoirs, Catching the, the Waves Life uh, in and out of politics, I'm, she said, I am by temperament quite gregarious, but the combination of my gender and my politics meant the position I occupied most often was that of a shag on a rock. Well, however, now, due to her de determination and drive, she is no longer isolated and she has exposed many people who adore her now and share her views and are determined to continue her accomplishments. I also want to share an anecdote from a good friend of mine that Susan was also a good mate of, uh, Dermot Ryan, uh, which my colleague mentioned before Dermot, um, a very active uh, person in the Irish Labor uh, groups within Australia and now um, uh, has just recently written a tribute uh, to uh, Susan. And he said this in uh, a tribute he recently wrote, what we really stood out was shared memories of her warmth and her sense of fun and mischief. At social events she moved seamlessly from singing a hymn to singing the International. She was a committed Australian Republican and was also on, uh, an Irish Republican. Whenever we met she would cheekily address me as Comrade Ryan, my favourite Irish unionist. Uh, knowing full well, of course, the unionist was, has a very different meaning in Australia to Ireland. My own late mother, having shared her name, I would retort, hello there, my second favourite Susan Ryan. A fighter for a just society for women and men, Susan Ryan has earned a place in the hearts of the labour movement and all Australians. I offer my condolences and solidarity to her family and friends. Vale, Susan Ryan. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Lyons. Thank you. I do rise uh, to associate my comments in relation to the passing of Susan Ryan with all senators in here, although I would have to say, um, unlike Senator um, Sheldon and O'Neill, uh, I'm neither Catholic nor Irish, um, but nevertheless I have a place in the Labor Party. Susan Ryan was first and foremost a feminist. She was a trailblazer, an activist and a republican. She was a first in so many fields, but none, in my view, as important as being elected, 
as the first female senator for the ACT and to go on to be the first woman in the Hawke cabinet. Indeed, when I joined the party in the early 80s, Susan Ryan was there and she was someone that I looked up to uh, in this place all the way from Western Australia and I looked at her in awe. But nevertheless, she showed us uh, as women in the Labor Party that there was a place for us because we could see what we could be. She uh, was truly amazing and the, the, um, the bills that she introduced, the sex discrimination bill in particular, have stood women in good stead. And that has enabled women to really advance in our society. But it is sad, as a number of people have reflected on, that we've still got a long way to go. And um, as a feminist in the Labor Party, Susan certainly made um, pathways for the rest of us. And she would be there. She would um, have applauded the fights that we had to get our affirmative action policies in place. And today she would have been honoured when our leader, Mr Albanese, dedicated our, Labor's, uh, our Labor budget statement to Susan Ryan. She was the first to have a particular statement for women. And today, uh, when we uh, launched our statement, it was in honour of Susan Ryan. I met Susan when I was um, the National Assistant Secretary of United Workers Union in her role as the Age Discrimination um, Commissioner when I uh, had responsibility for aged care in the union. And she was just as strident there as she was a member of the Hawke Cabinet. And yes, she was warm, and that certainly came across, but she was fierce in her advocacy. Um, I would like to end my contributions by paying my most sincere condolences to Rory, her partner, her children, Justine and Ben, and to most of all I say thank you to Susan Ryan for being that feminist, for paving the way for other Labor women. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyon. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. I also uh, rise to speak, I think, as the final speaker on this uh, condolence motion for the Honourable Susan. Sorry, almost final speaker. Um, no, behind you. For the Honourable Susan Ryan AO, and associate myself with um, all of the uh, previous contributions that have been uh, so lovely um, and um, comforting, I think, in terms of uh, the sudden and tragic passing of Susan within the last fortnight. Susan was not the first woman in this place, but she was a woman of many firsts. She was the first senator for the ACT, the first Labor senator for the ACT, the first Labor woman appointed to a front bench position, and the first Labor woman appointed to a ministry, and of course the first Labor woman to enter cabinet. She achieved all of these firsts in what was firmly a man's world joining the federal parliament at a time when only, uh, there were only six women and all were in the Senate. I can only imagine what that was like for her. For me, as a woman in politics, Susan just didn't just pave the way. She actually built the pathway that so many women have now taken, not only to this place in Australia's national parliament, but to so many places, to community organisations, unions, businesses. She, she proved to us that there was a seat at the table for all of us. It's really hard to describe or measure just how much trailblazers or pioneers of the women's movement like Susan Ryan have changed our country for the better. Her achievements, of which there were so many, were vast. Her influence in the parliament for 12 years, of course, her life post-politics, where she kept doing what she'd always done, applying herself to every cause she championed with more than 100 per cent of her energy bringing people with her, forming coalitions and, really importantly, being strategic about the pathway to victory and the pathway to lasting change. She campaigned for equality for women, for older Australians, for education for all. She was a staunch feminist in the Senate at a time when a lot of people, including some of her own caucus members, probably didn't know what that meant. 
She formed her political aspirations from second wave feminism and she knew that women's inequality required a po political solution that would be best enacted by women themselves. Before her parliamentary career, she sought to impact poli political decision making by helping to form the women's electoral lobby and later became an effective part of the 1972 electoral campaign. But in her own words, this lobbying was necessary but not sufficient. It left women on the outside of political power, waiting, persuading, threatening, but not acting directly to achieve change. How much more efficient, how much more effective if women were in there making the decisions themselves instead of knocking on the doors trying to attract support? Debate on the ill-fated Lamb-McKenzie Abortion Reform Bill in 1973 exemplified the problem. The debate was conducted in an all-male chamber while the women that this law was to affect were outside rallying, organising, shouting through loud hailers, preparing themselves for disappointment. Susan decided that next time she would be in there making the laws. In 1975, she was elected on the famed slogan, A Woman's Place is in the House and in the Senate. But that was just a subset of a much larger mission for Susan, which was that a woman's place was at the table where all the decisions were being made. She became Minister for Education and Youth Affairs when Bob Hawke was elected to office in 1983 and was tasked with the first portfolio on the status of women. At the time, and many speakers have, have reflected on this, women were unlikely to be approved for home loans, faced limited maternity leave positions provisions, if any, and were able to have their employment legally terminated on the account of marital status or falling pregnant. She sought to change this with her central objective for, for parliament being achieving economic independence for all, including women. Perhaps there is no greater example of the nation builder that she was in her pivotal role in two landmark acts, the Sex Discrimination Act and the Equal Employment Opportunity and the Affirmative Action Act. Later in life, she described her advocacy on the Sex Discrimination Act as probably the most useful thing she's done in her life. And uh, today, whilst not perfect by any means, we do generally live in a society that accepts that discrimination on the basis of gender is unlawful. But that wasn't the case during Susan's time in this place, and she, along with her Labor colleagues, some of whom she'd had to convince, set about to change that. Again, I can only imagine the pushback that came from some, uh, both to her personally and professionally, from waging a campaign like that that would have brought on. The nation was changing. Change is always difficult, and she was there helping that change come about. But it would be wrong to suggest or simply describe Susan as a trailblazing pioneer feminist. She was, of course, that, but she was so much more. She was an activist, an organiser, an educator, a senator, a, mender, a mentor, a proud Republican and, of course, a partner, a mother, a grandmother, a dear friend to so many. She was a com community campaigner, a fighter for equality across the board, an ad advocate for older Australians, a friend of First Nations. She joined organisations and, if they didn't exist, she started them. She was the proud founder of the Belconnen sub-branch of the ACT Labor Party, as I said, a founding member of WELL. She created communities of like-minded people and set about delivering the change that was needed. She drafted laws, campaigned for them, importantly, brought people with her, and of course those laws passed. Her influence and her impact, in the impact of her work in this place is enduring. To me, as a single mum wanting to get involved in politics, she showed me not only that it could be done, but in actual fact that it must be done, that there was an expectation on us to get involved and that it was only by getting involved that change happened. She told me, along with Joan Kerner, that women like me can't vacate the field. We have to step up. They convinced me, a single mother, that it was actually an asset, not a disadvantage, to bring my background to politics and that I would be a better politician uh, because of it. You always knew when Susan was in the room because she had a presence. It was something that's hard to pin down, but it was welcoming, supportive, kind, strong, principled, determined, focused and present. She was always present and she managed to reject all of that at the one time. So it's hard to believe we won't get to be in the same room with her anymore. 
but we are given strength and comfort in our knowledge that her reforms, her influence, her legacy, the things she changed, remains all around us, guiding us and reminding us, of course, of the unfinished work before us. To Susan's partner, her family, her children, her grandchildren and so many of her friends who have spoken over the past 11 days or so and who are so deeply uh, grieving at the moment and who remain devastated by her passing, I extend my sincere condolences. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. I would like to rise and add my voice to this condolence motion for the Honourable Susan Ryan AO, and I'd like to associate myself uh, with the many wonderful remarks in this debate. A trailblazer as a senator, as the first woman to hold a cabinet role in a federal Labor government, as Minister for Education and Youth Affairs, and as Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women in the Hawke government and later as Special Minister of State. Susan Ryan was indeed a trailblazer. I remember the mark that she made when I was a young girl and as a young journalist during the time that she successfully steered through the passage of the Sex Discrimination Act. Of course, much has changed in the Australian Senate since Susan Ryan was elected in 1975. My swearing in as a senator in October last year marked the first time that the number of female senators reached 50 per cent. When Susan Ryan was elected, there were only a handful of women senators. In the wake of the tumultuous dismissal of the Whitlam government, she was elected as one of the ACT's two senators. And observing her from afar as I did, I always got the impression that she was much more of a warrior for women and education than for party politics. And I think this was to her great credit and also, of course, um, very much to her legacy. Uh, her election pitch, as we've heard so often in this debate, was a woman's place is in the House and the Senate and everywhere that decisions are made. But I want to particularly acknowledge Susan Ryan's work in the area of sex discrimination. Uh, in November 1981, Susan had introduced a private senator's bill to outlaw sexual discrimination and the bill did not pass, but it did pave the way for the sex discrimination bill which of course was passed uh, eventually uh, in 1983. And the sex discrimination bill also embodied half of um, Susan Ryan's 1981 private bill in seeking to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex, marital status or pregnancy uh, and also contained provisions outlawing sexual harassment in the workplace and in educational institutions and provided for redress against individual acts of discrimination. It is, of course, quite difficult to imagine an era where sex discrimination was not actively prohibited uh, at a time, of course, when there was very substantial systemic discrimination levied against women uh, in all sectors of Australian society, whether it be a situation where women were refused a bank loan because they were women, uh, or whether they lost a job because they became pregnant, or whether they were refused entry or service in a hotel. Even joining the Nippers movement as a young surf lifesaver for girls was not an option. Surf lifesaving clubs did not even allow women to join as members until 1980, which is now something that young girls and women could not possibly comprehend. Susan Ryan was a successful champion of causes and her achievements were very considerable. Apart from combating sex discrimination, she oversaw increased funding for women's refuges and for childcare, as well as an increase in the retention rate to year 12 from 35 per cent to 53 per cent during the first four years of the Hawke government. After leaving parliament, Susan Ryan took on a number of private sector roles before she served as pro-chancellor for the University of New South Wales, she went on to be Deputy Chair of the Australian Republican Movement and then uh, in July 2011 she was appointed Australia's first Age Discrimination Commissioner and in 2014 Disability Discrimination Commissioner. I wish to convey my sincere condolences to her family and friends and I wish to acknowledge the wonderful contribution that Susan Ryan made to this place 
and to the betterment in particular of our country and particularly for Australian women. Vale, Suze, Susan Ryan. Thank you, Senator Henderson. There being no further speakers on the condolence motion, I ask honourable senators to stand and join in a moment of silence to signify assent. The motion is carried.